How do you start a business with no money? That's a great question. In fact, stick on all the way to the end of this video. Josh is gonna help you dispel a myth here that you can actually start a business and you need all this fancy equipment, you gotta get all this capital. Josh, in your myth here, The 100 Myths of Entrepreneurship versus Chainsaw, this best-selling book, by the way, uh, written by Josh, Canada's top CPA and number one business consultant in Canada. Josh, what do you recommend? What is the myth here, you know, that you need fancy equipment or locations to start? Is that really necessary? It's a myth. You don't need it. Yeah. You don't need fancy equipment and a location to start. In fact, it's probably going to increase your chances of failure. Right, because you're putting out a lot of outlay and stuff like that. That's right. When you start your business, your acumen isn't very good in, in a lot of different ways. And I, I don't say that to be mean, but it's like, hey, you don't really know what the customer thinks of your product or service, right? right? I mean, you're probably not missing it altogether, right? It's just, you know, you think that they want dark purple and they want light purple, right? You're gonna have to adjust it, right? Yeah. And so if you start with this big fancy setup in any business, you're probably gonna get it wrong. Mm. You're probably gonna buy the wrong equipment. Yep. You're probably gonna lay out the, the building or the space incorrectly because you actually don't know what It's all a guess, stuff. right, at that point? It's, yeah. it's all a guess, mm -hmm. right? Um, you're not very efficient at what you do. Mm -hmm. You don't have a big team at your disposal, right? Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of reasons, you know, if you actually have more capital, yeah, yeah it does have a chance to blow up quicker. Like it, yeah. it, it has a chance to generate more revenue quicker, Yeah. but it also has a significantly higher chance of failing quickly, yeah. right? Because you also can't outwork it too. Yeah. You have all this fancy equipment in a location, it's like you probably have big payments, whether yeah. those are loan payments or you know, lease payments, right? Mm -hmm. And it's sometimes hard to outwork those payments, right? Actually, a good example of this one, um, my, my wife or my ex-wife, I guess you can call it, you know, we were former business partners and it was in the restaurant business. And we had this concept idea that we had never tested, but we yeah. want to open up a French bistro. Yeah. Nothing too, you know, there are French bistros out there all the time. But like you said, you know, we had to raise half a million dollars. There was debt, there was lease for over five years that we had to pay, that we were committed to. That's there right. was construction payments that need to be paid. And, and that's literally how the business eventually imploded was because it was a test idea that they had to keep experimenting on, but they were bleeding money over and over and over every month. That's right. And it never got to the point where they were profitable, so she eventually had to close that business down. I mean, in the interim, you could have done catering. Yep. Cooked from your kitchen. We could have got social proof first. A rental, commercial kitchen. Could have right? done a food truck. Food truck. Yep. All of those examples, There's always least, you know, less costly startup ideas. Yep. They're usually less sexy. Yeah. They're usually not what you want, right? It's like the, the advice you gave in the other video to the, the chef that wants to open up a steakhouse, you know, and, and you say to him to start cooking cater, from home first. Food, cater from home, food truck number two, you know, uh, a uh, abandoned restaurant number three, yeah. someone who's already failed, you buy, it's not laid out the way you want, but it's it's there, it's cheap. And you take some cash flow going, yep. And then build a restaurant that you want. Then the banks start to give you money, right? That guy will will borrow on more preferential terms, he'll know his layout better, yeah. right? Like, there's so many things that's gonna come with that experience. You'll have suppliers right? that are already giving him prefer uh, preferential rates and stuff. Yeah. That's right, you'll, you'll, you know, you're gonna have to, you know, when you start out with a big setup, there's so many variables, right? You know, you're trying to go from zero staff to 10 staff. Mm -hmm. That's extraordinarily hard, right? Yeah. There's a lot of businesses that fail with unlimited amounts of capital, seemingly, yeah. who, you know, they, they just didn't, they couldn't recruit fast enough. The yeah. biggest example, one of the biggest, most recent examples was Aurora Cannabis. That's right. They raise a significant amount of capital, right? Mm -hmm. But all the reports I heard from anybody who was on the inside there is the place was a complete nightmare inside yeah. because they couldn't hire good enough people quickly. Yeah. And they had millions and millions of dollars to find the people, but it's not like they just existed overnight, That's right? right yeah. Um, so you the know, teams, the management, the, the loyalty, all those kind of things. Yeah. The systems, you know, if you're at this stage and you're thinking of, you know, starting a business, you're dramatically underestimating all the work it takes oh, yeah. to set up, right? Every small vendor just getting insurance, you know, getting a letterhead, you know, finding a way to report your taxes, mm -hmm. um, you know, finding a mailing address, setting up a website, like all of these things are exponentially harder. They're when, easier when to make hire it and do HR and yeah. Yeah, and so I, this becomes, you know, the, the rationale, right? But it's, you know, 58% of businesses, mm -hmm. they're actually started with $5,000 or less. That's right, yeah, you got the 58%, quote right here. 58%, right? Yep. 
it's important to kind of understand that. Like, I mean, I started the, the CPA practice. I had a line of credit for $40,000. Yeah. I didn't have big money. Mm -hmm. I didn't invest in a big office, right? I had you know, money that I could buy some equipment, buy some software licensing, and that was about it, right? Yeah. Um, in reality, if you had given me not a $40,000 line of credit, but a $4 million line of credit, I wouldn't have made very good use of it at that yeah, time true. because I, you know, I was guessing at that point of exactly what did I, what did the customers want, mm -hmm. right? And then what do I need to deliver what the customers want? At a right? price point that gives you the right margin that keeps you profitable. That's right. All, all of those were, you know, they're kind of a mystery, mm -hmm. right? And so that that myth isn't just true; it's actually dangerously false. Yeah, it's dangerously false. Where you probably have a higher chance of success with less capital invested at the beginning because it forces you to test your ideas on a shoestring. Correct, 100%. And so Josh, I know you mentioned a lot of stuff in our other playlist here. By the way, if you're enjoying this video and you, you've got some great questions, do leave us a comment in the comments below. Josh and myself personally do go through the comments and answer the questions. Um, Josh, whenever you give advice to business owners about how to start a business with no money, what are the steps involved? Let's say you've got absolute beginners here, or you've got someone who's an intermediate. I'm just gonna assume that you know you might have already made, I don't know, 10,000, let's say 50,000, within that range, right? Yeah. They've made their first year, they've made some money, uh, but they wanna grow and scale, they're still a solopreneur. What are some steps? Versus the person who's a complete beginner right now, who's just got yeah. some crazy idea in their head. I mean, one of the, the is, so if you're, you're at a person who's 10 to 50,000, right? Yeah. I'll even back it up, I'll give you both, right? Okay, sure. Say you're zero, right? Okay. Yep. If you're zero, try to go sell 10 things to 10 people. Correct. Just start there first. Before you spend you know, a six figure on anything, try to go sell 10 things to 10 people. Most... Don't build a website, don't get business cards yet. Don't go set up a personal phone line for the business. Don't get an office yet. Yeah, just not knock a couple doors, make a couple phone calls, yeah. sell some things, right? Deliver that service, collect the money on time. That's right. Um, you know, one of the easiest things that you can start with is subcontracting up from other people in the industry. Oh, that's great. Idea. That is one of the easy, if you're struggling to make those first 10 sales, yeah. try to sell it to other people, right? Yeah. Um, you, Example is uh, if you're an electrician, you don't want to work for a boss anymore, you're trying to break away from him, um, you know, go and find some of his other competitors that you might subcontract some work first. Then when you're in that say ten to fifty thousand dollars, or even I'll put it even ten to a hundred thousand dollars, right? Uh, because a lot of people can get to that kind of six figure uh, type revenue, and maybe it's ten, maybe it's a hundred. Right? Depends on what industry, like trades and stuff, that you might get there faster, right? Yeah. The next thing you're gonna have to figure out is scalable marketing. Right. Okay. You're gonna have to figure out marketing that works not because of you know the. Uh, time that you put in, yeah. but you know how to trade money mm -hmm. at a reasonable price for leads that so come for, back. For every dollar you put in, you get maybe whatever, a lead that's worth more than a dollar. That's or right. For every hundred dollars you spend, you get a lead that's worth two hundred dollars. Right. That will be the first thing that you probably want to invest some money on because that's you know that's going to be necessary to scale up. Yeah. Then and, you're going to actually come from personal credit, right? You could just use your personal credit. It could be a shareholder loan, sweat equity. Even. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Say you you know you generate fifty and you live off of forty. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you have ten. Yeah. And you save that up and you can invest that in marketing, right? Yeah. Before you ever sign on the dotted line or you know take out a home equity loan mm -hmm. or. You know, a bank loan for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like, are, are you sure you know how to market and sell at scale? Right. Most people do not. And it's not to say that you can't learn. It's just you haven't done it yet. Yeah. And you want to learn that skill before you have a two, three, five, ten, twenty thousand dollar a month payments coming out on leases and equipment. Our client's going to trust you just from looking at an ad. Um, do you understand about copywriting? Do you understand about social proof? Do you have? Reviews, Google reviews. You know how to do a sales presentation. That's right. right? You know, uh, all of those things are, are extremely important, right? And so I would suggest that not having the ideal, you know, the ideal starting capital yep. uh, to start might be a blessing in disguise mm. in terms of your, you know, your trajectory. Right? Yep. I mean, long term, it's a limiting factor. Yep. In, in Canada, it's a special limiting factor. It's harder to get business loans in Canada than it is in the U.S. Yep. And, and, you know, we're arguably, we're less productive because of it, because we have less equipment available for every worker in Canada, for every man, woman, and child in Canada. Yeah. There's only about $10,000 of business equipment purchased every year. And in the US, it's 
it's uh, you know it's uh, about fourteen thousand, right? Josh, what do you say about the for the entrepreneur that goes, oh, you know what? I've got this great idea, and I'm trying to get a grant, or I'm going to go see a venture capitalists, or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to try to raise some capital, you know, and, and we're going to get this fancy office. And it's not a statistically great play. Right? Right. It's a sexy play. You see it on on Shark Tank, right? Mm -hmm. And you think. Well, first of all, you know most of those deals you see on Shark Tank, never even, work they out. never, they actually fail due diligence and never get funded, right? Yeah. Ninety-five percent of every venture capital backed business is not profitable. Yeah. Right? They encourage high risk, high reward decisions. With you know one company does, you know fifty x, and the other nineteen companies that they invest in a roadkill, right? Yeah. That's all they want out of their yeah. One you know, those nineteen are cannon right? fodder. They know one out of twenty is going to succeed. So yeah, the other nineteen they go bankrupt. I mean, if you're a nothing burger and you raise a million dollars, guess mm. what? You don't own fifty-one percent anymore. Yeah. that's not how that works, no. right? Um, you're probably going to own twenty percent maybe, right? Um, so it's not a statistically good play, yeah. right? I mean, conventional bank financing is usually only a few years away. Mm -hmm. You demonstrate to a bank that you can actually generate. Profits, yeah. increasing profits, and increasing revenue. Mm -hmm. That bank's going to fund you at commercial rates, and you still own 100% of your business yeah. at that point. And then, how many years of, of, of proof do you need in general? Maybe two, three years. Generally two. Yeah. Yeah. Generally two years of increasing, two full years. Right. Yeah. So you got to you know make some allowances because most people start you know partway through something you know a year, right? So two full years of increasing um, profits, mm -hmm. you know, revenue, and profits, which might be hard because you might not be profitable in year one, right? Yeah. Uh, but you start getting that now you become a commercially viable you know, entity yeah and you're likely going to be able to you know finance things wow that's so, so that's fantastic advice there josh um if you enjoyed the advice from josh and you want to find out more maybe come and visit him and meet him in person check out the boot camp pick up a copy of the book leave a review and come and experience what it's like to be around other seven eight even six figure business owners and mingle with them Listen to what they have to say. Find out the steps that Josh lays out on how you can grow and scale your business so that you don't end up as one of the statistics in 96% and you actually make it to the 4%. We hope to see you on the other side. We hope to see you in the next video.